Welcome to Infections in Orthopedics. And before we begin, I want you to have a broad idea about the infections in the bone. Now, when I say infections in the musculoskeletal system, I want you to understand two things. The first thing that the organism that causes infection in the musculoskeletal structures is usually your Staphylococcus aureus. And this holds strong. There are some exceptions to this, which we will discuss later, but most of the times it is Staphylococcus aureus. The second thing I want you to understand is the root of this infection that reaches the bone comes from the blood. So the root is hematogenous spread. So it reaches is the bone or the musculoskeletal structures from the blood all right now there is an infection of the bone and the medullary cavity and then there can be infection of the joint the infection of the bone in the medullary cavity is what we call as osteomyelitis and the infection of the joint is what we call as septic arthritis okay so bone in the medullary cavity osteomyelitis and joint is septic arthritis now there can be pyogenic organisms and there can be tubercular organisms pyogenic organisms like i said most commonly is staphylococcus aureus and tubercular is mycobacterium tuberculosis the stark difference that i wanted to focus on between these two organisms is that whenever there is a tb infection the local findings are very minimal like local inflammatory reactions are less and the periosteal reaction secondary to the infection would be less so keep it in the back of your mind that pyogenic organisms cause a massive local reaction whereas tubercular organisms cause a minimal local reaction all right with that said let's start with osteomyelitis osteomyelitis is the infection of the bone or the medullary cavity bone in the medullary cavity or bone or the bone marrow together that is what it is the most common organism causing uh, osteomyelitis is your staphylococcus aureus i told you it works everywhere that is the organism you have to remember and the root of spread is hematogenous please do not forget that now, what is the most common affected bone and what is the usual age group of these patients? Now, please understand that the usual age group of patients affected by osteomyelitis is patients with a decreased immunity. Either they are extremely young or they are extremely old. Usually, they are children. So, young children whose immunity is low, they will get infection by osteomyelitis from the hematogenous root. Now, the root most commonly is hematogenous. It can be direct also. For example, if there is an open fracture, organism can come from outside into the bone or there can be a post-operative infection like iatrogenic surgical infections. They can be again Staphylococcus aureus. Now the most common site overall or in infants or in children is your distal femur followed by tibia is your distal femur please remember distal femur and particularly metaphysis so osteomyelitis most commonly affects the metaphysis of the long bones and there is a reason for that why because in the metaphysis of the long bones you would remember from our anatomy lecture that the blood vessels are arranged in this unique hairpin loop fashion and because of this there is stasis of the blood flowing through the veins so the blood vessels whether it's artery or vein are arranged in this hairpin loop fashion and when the blood is passing through these vessels they have sluggish flow and because of this sluggish flow there is a relative ischemia or relative hypoxia in that area all right because of this sluggish flow there is relative hypoxia and because of this sluggish flow there is venous stasis and because of this venous stasis there is hypoxia and organisms thrive here that is one reason second reason is that this area is more vascular and the third and the most important reason is that this area is relatively deficient in your macrophages and monocytes that is why organisms thrive when they enter the metaphysis all right so that is the most common site over overall distal femur all right but if they specifically ask you what is the most common site in adults for osteomyelitis then you can say vertebra then you can say vertebra vertebra is the most common site of osteomyelitis in adults okay so what is the most common cause of osteomyelitis staph now what they can do is they can slightly change the question to trick you if they say what is the most common cause of osteomyelitis overall acute chronic or in developed world or developing world hiv aids immunocompromised patients open fracture post-operatively friends your answer doesn't changes it still remains staphylococcus aureus okay staphylococcus aureus is the most common organism causing osteomyelitis right osteomyelitis now but there are exceptions to this what are the exceptions the first exception i want you to remember is sickle cell disease patients now sickle cell disease patients usually get osteomyelitis secondary to an organism called salmonella 
salmonella now salmonella causes osteomyelitis in the diaphysis of the long bone and the osteomyelitis of salmonella involves several symmetrical bones several symmetrical bones are involved not only one bone so there is several symmetrical bony involvement so if they say there is a sickle cell disease patient who has osteomyelitis of the metaphysis what could be the most common cause the most common cause in such a patient again friends is staphylococcus aureus so please keep this in the back of your mind so what are the other exceptions the other exceptions if a patient is on prolonged parenteral therapy prolonged parenteral therapy like for example total parental nutrition these patients they acquire osteomyelitis from fungal infections fungal organisms if you have an iv drug abuser iv drug abuser this iv drug abuser will contract osteomyelitis by an organism called pseudomonas pseudomonas now if you acquire osteomyelitis following animal bites it is usually because of an organism called pasturella and if you acquire osteomyelitis following human bites it is usually by an organism called Ikinella. okay so these are the usual exceptional questions that they ask in your exam please try to memorize them there are many more which you will find in the pearls now let's try to understand the pathophysiology of how this osteomyelitis causes problems to us now this organism reaches the metaphysis of the long bone and once it is in the metaphysis it starts to proliferate and based on its proliferation there can be an acute osteomyelitis or eventual chronic osteomyelitis so i want you to understand the pathophysiology as a whole spectrum of the disease and then i will tell you how it is different in acute osteomyelitis and chronic osteomyelitis and what are the key differentiators of both these two conditions although i personally believe that it's a spectrum of disease and that is how i wanted to remember it so now i have a scheme of diagrams here i have a schematic representation of a bone here where you can see that this is your epiphysis this is your metaphysis this is your diaphysis and in the metaphysis i have tried to draw those hairpin loop arrangement of blood vessels now the organism from the hematogenous root reaches the metaphysis and it starts to grow here and this is that organism here now this happens within 24 hours of infection now within 24 hours of infection as the organism starts to multiply or grow here the patient will have your systemic findings like high grade fever local rise of temperature pain and all those problems that you would see in any acute infection or inflammation now if there is no intervention within these 24 hours as in antibiotics are not given what happens this organism starts to thrive more and grow more in size and when it grows more in size that is when you have a large abscess that is formed so small group of cells that have come here the organisms are here so very small it would have been treated or corrected by antibiotic now has grown into a large mass that is an abscess and that happens usually after 24 hours of infection okay so that happens after 24 hours of infection and this is your abscess now over time if this abscess is all also neglected what happens is the nutrition that was supposed to go to the bone is being consumed by the organism that is thriving there so what happens to the bone that is deprived of its nutrition the bone starts to die the bone starts to die this piece of dead bone that is there in the center of this abscess is what is known as your sequestra is what is known as your sequestra right so so far you've understood these three things organism reached the metaphysis started to thrive there there is abscess wing formation abscess formed and the bone started to die and the piece of bone that dead was dead inside this abscess is known as your sequester so far so good now this is what i want you to understand as the abscess that has grown inside the bone continues to grow the periosteum that is surrounding the bone the periosteum that is surrounding the bone here starts to react the periosteum starts to react this is what is known as your periosteal reaction what is this periosteal reaction friends it's your periosteum reacting to an insult the insult can be your infection the insult can be an inflammation the insult can be a tumor it can be anything your periosteum will react by forming new bone so this is your body's attempt to contain the spread of an infection in the bone this is your periosteal reaction so when does this periosteal reaction form it forms around 7 to 10 days this is important it forms around 7 to 10 days so please understand this please try to understand this everything will fall into place once you've understood this so periosteal reaction happens to start around 7 to 10 days 
now there is this sequestrum like i told you and now since there is this dead piece of bone inside the bone sitting there what happens the organism starts to thrive the organism starts to thrive and when the organism starts to thrive the abscess keeps on growing in size keeps on growing in size keeps on growing in size and then it eventually starts to move towards the periphery of the bone now this periosteal reaction that had started around 7 to 10 days would have start to form more bone around the infection more bone around this infection now this new bone that is formed around the infection is basically your body's attempt to control the spread of the lesion so this new bone that is being formed around the infection to control its spread is what is known as your involucrum are you following friends are you following the terminology here so there is infection there this infection has become an abscess there and this has caused periosteal reaction now the dead piece of bone inside the abscess of the granulation tissue is what is your sequestrum and the periosteal reaction eventually forms a new bone around the infection to control its spread it is called as involucrum now this abscess continues to keep on growing and reaches the periphery and as it reaches the periphery it has to perforate the involucrum to come outside now this perforation in the involucrum for the abscess contents to escape outside is what is known as your cloaca so what is cloaca friends the opening in the involucrum now once it has come out of the involucrum it will be obstructed by soft tissue your fascia your muscles and soft tissue and it will pass through perforate all of those things and eventually reach the skin perforate the skin and come out and discharge so this discharge through the skin is what is known as your sinus so are you following this is the spectrum of the disease organism reached the metaphysis started multiplying abscess bone died sequestrum periosteum started to react periosteal reaction new bone started to form around the infection to prevent the spread of the lesion that is your involucrum abscess perforated the involucrum cloaca perforated the skin and came out sinus these are the terms i want you to be familiar with abscess sequestrum involucrum periosteal reaction cloaca and sinus is this clear now a few basic mcqs here when does the abscess form after 24 hours when does the periosteal reaction form around 7 to 10 days around 7 to 10 days so this is the spectrum of the disease now people have classified osteomyelitis into acute and chronic although it's a spectrum of disease they have classified it so what is the key differentiator between acute and chronic osteomyelitis it is friends the presence of sequestrum so here everything before this is what we call as your acute osteomyelitis and here everything after that is what we call as your chronic osteomyelitis so the pathological hallmark of acute osteomyelitis friends is abscess so if there is abscess acute osteomyelitis the pathological hallmark of chronic osteomyelitis friends is sequestrum so pathological hallmark for acute osteomyelitis is abscess pathological hallmark for chronic osteomyelitis is sequestrum what about the clinical hallmark clinically acute osteomyelitis does not have a lot it has pain local rise of temperature and fever which is not specific but the clinical hallmark of a chronic osteomyelitis is this active discharging sinus so three mcqs pathological hallmark for acute osteomyelitis abscess pathological hallmark for chronic osteomyelitis sequestrum clinical hallmark for chronic osteomyelitis is sinus now what is this involucrum what is this sequestrum what is this cloaca self-explanatory abscess collection of pus what is sequestrum sequestrum is this dead bone sequestered being hidden from the other parts right because the bone is dead it is hidden inside and everything is dead means the haversian canal the wokeman's canal everything is dead and distorted and since it is dead the bone should be dense or porotic it should be dense because there is no blood coming into the bone and there is no blood coming to the bone the bone is relatively dense so sequestrum is a dead dense bone it's a dead dense bone so how will it appear on x-ray dead dense bone will appear white so dead dense white bone and it usually is light so dead dense white light bone that is what your sequestrum is we'll talk about more about sequestrum later what is this involucrum involucrum is this new bone formation involucrum is this new bone formation formed around the peripheries of the bone what is this cloaca cloaca is the opening in the involucrum through which the pus comes out what is this sinus sinus is the discharging or opening in the skin through which the pus drains out right so these are the various things that i want you to understand acute osteomyelitis followed by chronic osteomyelitis now there are certain chronological classifications of osteomyelitis also as in acute is less than two weeks chronic more than 
four weeks and then there is sub acute osteomyelitis that is two weeks to four weeks of infection it's not a very renowned classification but it's still there now what are the clinical features of the patient who presents to you with osteomyelitis now like i said these are the patients who have decreased immunity these are extremely young children or extremely old or elderly people this will be a child who will be toxic toxic as in high grade fever the patient will have high grade failure fever the patient will be uh, you know like the characteristics of failure to thrive he will have decreased appetite the patient will not eat anything or drink anything there will be pain and tenderness particularly where around the knee joint because it occurs most commonly in the distal femur around the knee joint the patient will have swelling local rise of temperature redness all of these things will be there the patient because of this pain wouldn't move the limb and if he does not move the limb you call it paralysis but is it real paralysis it is not that is why it is pseudo paralysis it is pseudo paralysis so when there is infection and because of infection there is pain the patient will not move the limb this is pseudo paralysis pseudo paralysis is something we read something else pseudo paralysis is something we read somewhere else where else did we read pseudo paralysis exactly we read it in scurvy where there was sub periosteal hemorrhages right we read it in scurvy also where there was sub periosteal hemorrhages because of this sub periosteal hemorrhages the patient refused to move the limb right the patient refused to move the limb so a toxic child high grade fever pseudo paralysis all of these things with local findings of local rise of temperature and swelling all of these things will be there now how do you manage what is the first thing that you should do in a patient of acute osteomyelitis as soon as the patient is presented to you you have to collect the blood sample and this is the first step in management why is this so important because if you do not collect the blood sample prior to starting any antibiotic you are disturbing the flora you are disturbing the flora and so the reports of the culture would be negative and if you don't know the organism or the bug that is causing the infection the treatment will become difficult so first thing to do is collect the blood sample and then you can start patient on broad spectrum antibiotics after you have collected the blood sample so what do you send this blood sample for you can send it for complete blood picture cbp that is and then esr and your crp all of these things will be elevated total lymphocyte count will be high there will be increased neutrophil counts also all of these things will be there now you can also send this blood sample for culture and sensitivity to find the bug right so it's only around in 50% of the cases will the culture be positive so please remember this number only around 50% of the cases the culture will be positive and once the culture is positive you can do the sensitivity test to assess which antibiotics work well works well for this bug so culture and sensitivity till then you can give broad spectrum antibiotics now recently uh, there has been increased use of serum procalcitonin serum pro calcitonin in order to diagnose all these infective conditions it is considered as the most sensitive and specific marker in osteomyelitis also you give patient analgesics antipyretics and you have to apply a splint to rest the limb so that the patient does not have pain and you can apply ice packs and elevate the limb in order to control the swelling okay in order to control the swelling now let's talk about the radiology of osteomyelitis this is a very important uh, discussion here because there are a few mcqs that is being tested here so there are various modalities of investigation radiologically you have x-rays bone scans and mri the investigation of choice or the best investigation radiological investigation would be mri please understand that it would be mri and the reason is it picks up the diagnosis earliest it picks it up within 24 hours it picks up within 24 hours and what would you see on an mri you will see marrow edema marrow edema now after mri what is the next best radiological investigation bone scan bone scan also picks up quite early and what are the various modalities that you use in bone scan use technetium 99 you can use gallium 67 and you can use indium triple one which is the best friend the best is your indium triple one label with wbc's okay indium triple one is the best labeled with wbc's as the bone scan now what about x-ray now what about x-ray when does the x-ray pick up changes in osteomyelitis and what is the earliest bony change picked up on x-ray so please be careful here there are two or three tricky mcqs here the x-ray changes becomes apparent earliest within 48 hours of the infection 
within 48 hours of the infection and the first x-ray finding that you would notice so the first x-ray finding i said the first x-ray finding that you would notice is soft tissue swelling or soft tissue lucency soft tissue swelling or soft tissue lucency this is the earliest x-ray finding that you will pick up on x-ray but if they ask you what is the first bony change picked up on x-ray the first or the earliest bony change picked up on x-ray friends is your periosteal reaction periosteal reaction and when is it picked up it is picked up by 7 to 10 days or the other answer is 2 weeks 7 to 10 days or the other answer is 2 weeks so please remember this these are the various x-ray or radiological modalities and the mcqs related to them but if they ask you what is the gold standard investigation or what is the best investigation for diagnosing osteomyelitis the best investigation friends is the tissue and where will you get this tissue from the biopsy okay so biopsy of the bone is the best investigation and the reason is very simple the root of infection is hematogenous it can be direct or it can be because of iatrogenic or post op so if it's direct or iatrogenic then the blood would usually be negative right the blood would usually be negative so the best investigation is your tissue and that you collect from the osteomyelitis side now coming to the treatment now this is interesting because if the patient presents to you within 24 hours means it's not become an abscess yet if it's not become an abscess yet you start the antibiotics obviously you have to give supportive therapy also like antipyretics and analgesics also you start the antibiotics and you give two weeks of parenteral antibiotics followed by four weeks of oral antibiotics and how do you assess the response of antibiotics you assess the response of antibiotics with the help of c-reactive protein this is very good marker because it increases within six hours reaches a peak by two days and then normalizes by one week so it's a very good marker and that is what you use you use crp if the treatment starts the patient responds crp comes down and if the patient is not responding or it comes to you after 24 hours what does it mean friends it means that there is an abscess and whenever there is an abscess in the bone or in the body you have to drain it and unless you drain it you cannot treat it so you have to drain the abscess under antibiotic cover so what am i trying to tell you here i'm trying to tell you here is that the acute osteomyelitis can be managed with medical therapy can be managed conservatively without any intervention if the patient presents early on or if the patient responds within 24 hours but if the patient presents after 24 hours you have to remove the abscess and the only way to drain the abscess in a bone is by making multiple drill holes you make multiple drill holes in the bone so that the pus drains out